So what you should know for test purposes is that there's three methods of valuation. Three methods of valuation we use for real estate. The sales, cost, and income approach. Know it, just like you gotta know it. Sales, cost, and income. Sometimes we call the sales approach the direct sales comparison approach. Turns out the one we use most often, you as real estate agents, you will use the direct sales comparison approach. So anything with the word sales comparison in it is all the same thing. Sometimes we call it the market approach to real estate. All right. On the top of page 160, there's some terms we have to talk about so that we can put it all together for you. And the first one is subject. The subject property is the property that you're analyzing and that you, you're going to put a price on. So the subject property is the one that you're going to analyze and put a price on. It might be the one that you're going to list for sale. So before you can list a property, you want to check and see what the value, you know, what's, what's it worth. Sometimes homeowners, they already know what they want to sell the property for. But you have a fiduciary responsibility to them to still research the property, show them comparables, and advise them that when it sells, an appraiser will use these same comparables. And they have to support the value because most people don't pay cash. So since they're getting a mortgage, they're going to need to get comparables and support the value for a lender. So, so it's part of your fiduciary responsibility is to make sure that you're letting them know, even if they already know what they want for the property, even if you agree with them because you grew up in that neighborhood and you know it well, you might be their neighbor. So you really know property values. Don't get lazy. Don't get lazy and just skip steps because you just think you know. Because the nice people are the ones that can turn around and sue you later for not representing their best interests. So make sure you always follow protocols. You don't want to cut corners. Even though it's tempting to do that, don't, don't cut corners. It'll turn out that that market analysis that you do to list that property and to support the value may be used to help the buyers understand that you're pricing this property properly. Okay. In the top third of 160, we look at a number of items to help you determine whether a neighborhood is comparable or not. So if you can go through this list and say to yourself, oh yeah, this neighborhood has similar schools, similar access to shopping, similar public utilities available, similar access to highways, throughways, etc., similar age homes, similar quality homes, similar style homes, these are all the attributes of what makes a neighborhood a neighborhood. So if you're picking comparables on the same street, that's all great. You know? um, but I own rental property in South Buffalo-ish. Like, I think it's South Buffalo, off of McKinley Parkway. Uh, Woodside Avenue, to be specific. Woodside goes all the way to South Park Avenue or Hopkins. It might go to Hopkins and then goes all the way the other way north of McKinley Parkway. So if you find comparables on Woodside for the property that you're listing, if you go close to McKinley, your values will be much, much higher than if you're near uh, South Park Avenue. Anyway, so being on the same street's not enough because if you live in that area, you know that if you want a high value, you go closer to McKinley. If you want a true value, you go closer to South Park, especially because the property might be closer to Woodside and, uh, and South Park, okay? So that's how it's so easy to come up with wrong values. And then if you remember from last week's session, I was talking about visiting open houses and, and getting familiar with neighborhoods. This is why it's so important to really know your neighborhood. Because if you didn't know the neighborhood, and let's say, you know, um, Shana comes from the falls to list a house in South Buffalo because she was on the phones, answering the phones, and like someone says, hey, can you sell my house? And she's like, sure, I'd love to. She might not know that the values change significantly every block of that long, long street. Now, a little bit of research will tell you that. But... You know, it's just, it's something, 
it, there's something to be said about really getting to know the neighborhoods carefully. And when you list that property, the owner will know whether or not you know neighborhood the neighborhood well. Okay, so there's a lot more to real estate than just you know obviously learning all of this. You've got a lot, you've got a lot of learning ahead of you uh, once you get your license. Okay, so at the bottom of page 160. Um, okay, so number one. Sometimes you have to go to a different neighborhood to find comps. So the reason why we share with you what makes a neighborhood comparable is because if you don't have comps in the same neighborhood, because you want to use current sales, okay? You want to use current sales that are close by. Sometimes you don't have that. So this is the, this you're not tested on this. This is strictly a guide for you to use so that when you, can't find comps, what are the parameters that an appraiser uses to decide what makes another neighborhood comparable or not? The bottom of 160, we talk about the market sets the price, not the professional. So even though the seller might hate you because you don't come up with a high value for the property, you gotta let them know, you know, don't take offense, but the comparables establish the price. I'm just conveying the message to you, all right? Next page, 161. Uh, just give that a cursory review the top half of the page. We just could give you like the differences that make, the difference between a CMA or comparative or competitive market analysis, CMA stands for competitive or comparative market analysis, and an appraisal. We give you the differences between the two. But there is a testable item at the bottom of page 161, and that's the definition for arm's length. So an arm's length transaction is a good thing. An arm's length transaction is the kind of comparable sales you want to select. You might say to yourself, well, how do I, des how do I find an arm's length transaction? First, we've got to de determine what it is. An arm's length transaction is a sale that was offered on the open competitive marketplace for a reasonable period of time with no duress and nothing weird that happened in the background. We say no unusual circumstances that affects the transaction. And we want to make sure that the seller was not under any duress or the buyer wasn't under any duress to buy or sell. So how do you find out? Well, last week we talked to you about Erie.gov, and I know we've got some new people uh, attending tonight. And Erie.gov... If you go to www.erie.gov, it'll take you to the uh, Erie County government system online. Then you want to click on County Clerk. And when you click on County Clerk, you want to look at online records. And that's where you can pull up anything and everything based on either the name of the property owner or the property address. When you pull up tax records, you get information that helps you determine whether it was an arm's length transaction. So if I see that the owner, the previous owner of the house, which is the grantor, remember grantors sign the deed. You don't become a grantor till you sell the property. So the grantor signs the deed and when you look on the tax records and you see that the previous owner was HSBC Bank, Bells and whistles should go off saying to you, whoa, whoa, wait a minute, this is not normal. This is not an arm's length transaction. Because most people don't buy homes that were sold by a bank. They buy it from a, from a typical private homeowner or maybe from a builder, but that's it. So then the question is, was it a short sale was it a foreclosure? Usually it's a foreclosure. Okay. That home might have been sold by blah, 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 trust. Well, that's not normal either. So the, the long story short here is that if that's a situation, you don't use those sales. You use sales that are between a typical buyer and a typical seller. Nothing weird. Okay. See a question here. What if you cannot find a comparable property within close proximity? Okay, so Lisa, if you can't find a property in close proximity, then you go back to page 160 and you find another neighborhood 
that has similar quality schools, similar access to shopping. And then uh, Gino says, are there apps or aids that can help you with making comps? Um, you know, people, people use, um, people use Zillow and Bing and things like that. I, I don't like having computers make decisions like that. I can barely, I can barely feel comfortable having TurboTax do my taxes, less alone. I'd like to see, I remember the good old days, which was only four years ago, where I could go and put all the entries in everywhere. And then now TurboTax, they just, it does whatever it wants. And you just cross your fingers and hope for the best, you know. Uh, Brianna's got West Side. Now West Side, uh, I'm just going to jump around as you, as you, as you uh, respond. The West Side, that's a, that's like, there's a lot more to the West Side than the West Side. The multiple listing system actually breaks it down to, I believe, four different zones that make up the west side. I think the west side used to be zone four, but it, it doesn't matter what the zone is. You're not tested on that. Um, if you're west side near Bryant, then it's going to be a lot higher than if you're west side near uh, Niagara Street. Okay? So it matters. I, I wouldn't use Niagara Street comps for something near Bidwell, which is still part of the west side, too. Okay? Uh, Elmwood, um, Elmwood, let's see, like Elmwood's a long street, Emily. You got to give me like another street that's well known. I mean, Elmwood near Buff State, you know, Elmwood near like what? Okay. Now, I, I have to tell you, I have never, ever, ever had a problem finding comps in Cheektowaga. Cheektowaga is the land of comps. Even when the market's bad, People in Cheektowaga, they don't know it. They just they keep buying and selling. You know, like that's a great area to sell real estate. If, if you work in Cheektowaga, you have a lot of competition, but you'll never be bored. There's always someone's always people are dying, people are getting divorced, people are people don't they don't realize when there's a bad market. Not that we're in a bad market. I mean, well, this week's not good, but um, Cheektowaga is great. Cheektowaga and Lancaster are great. And, and you know what's funny? Uh, Again, I always say funny. I don't mean funny. The, the homeowners will say to you, I need this dollar amount. People really think that there's a connection between what they need and value and that if I like, if I need a lot of money, then my house is worth more. And so bizarre. And, you know, you have to try really hard to not laugh hysterically at people when they say these things to you because they will say it with a straight face. And you can't. You're like, you just can't. You can't do that. Um, so the, where you pick the comps will be really important. Homeowners are very biased. Everyone is. Everyone's more biased for the most part. And I would say to you that uh, you'll see them pushing value if they're picking the comps closer to Main Street when, in fact, they should be at the other end closer to Chittawaga. And I would not use comps from a superior school district like Williamsville compared to Cheektowaga. That's really, really important. That's an area over there, Stephanie, that you gotta be real careful where you pick your comps. And you gotta pick homes that are similar age range. Uh, the homes in that area there, uh, anywhere from you know, 50 to 80 plus years in age. So you don't wanna pick much newer properties. Definitely don't wanna pick anything under 30 years old. That would be really, inappropriate for that neighborhood. Okay, so that's enough. Uh, I, I can't go on for much more with that. That's, but I think you get the idea of what I'm trying to say. I hope you do. All right, so back to where we uh, left off. So arm's length transaction. We look at the tax records and we want to make sure that it wasn't sold by a bank, that the last owner was not the estate of or in trust. Um, when you look at the multiple listing record for that property, now that stuff lives on forever. Like when you list a house, it's years and years and years. You can pull that up in the MLS, multiple listing system. The days on market is really important. If I look at the, that's DOM, days on market. If the days on market for a property is 300, when you know that things sell in two, three days or two, three weeks, don't use that sale. That would disqualify it from the arm's length transaction uh, concept that we're talking about. Okay. If you see uh, another thing, and then I need to move on, another thing that you want to watch for is if 
the transaction involved owner financing. If the owner's financing the property, well, we know most properties are not sold as a result of owner financing, that should raise red flags. And that would disqualify that property from being used as an arm's length transaction, okay? Page 162, we talk about why should we use current listings? Why should we use expired listings? First of all, most realtors today, they don't use expired listings, but it doesn't mean that you can't. Properties, there's only two reasons why a home doesn't sell. It's either overpriced or undermarketed. And the, the, the real estate, the dynamics of the real estate market doesn't lend itself to you not being able, like, you won't get the listings if it's undermarketed. Like, you, you can't even compete anywhere in, you know, like, let's say the Williamsville area, or even if you're in Hamburg, Orchard Park, you know, if you're the southern areas there, the, the dynamics of the marketplace, you can't even be in business if you're under marketing properties. So it really boils down to uh, overpriced or undermarketed, and it's overpriced for the condition it's in. So if, if there's if the property hasn't been updated and you're pricing it as if it has been, that's called overpriced. And there's lots of reasons why people overprice. The biggest reason is the home seller wants a certain number. Maybe they didn't keep up with the property. They didn't make the modifications to it to maintain it. And, uh, you know, next thing you know, they're ready to sell it. And it looks the same way as it looked 12 years ago when they moved in. You know, you've got, you've got to update your property. If you don't update it and at least maintain it, it's going to affect you when you turn around to sell that property. So current listings show you what your competition is. You shouldn't be higher than the listings that are currently in the area because that's automatically you're going to help sell those properties. Expired listings, they expire for a wide variety of reasons. So as I said, overpriced or undermarketed. Uh, that's one of the reasons why people try to stay away from expired listings, but they can help you support a value, you know, especially like, like I said, overpriced is the main reason why properties don't sell. You can show other properties that were overpriced as part of your market analysis when you sit with the homeowner. And this way you can show them, I don't want you to become an expired listing because that doesn't accomplish anything then, you know, you don't you want the home to sell. We talk about making adjustments, in the middle of page 163, just give that a cursory review. Page 164, this is an example of a subject property and comparable sales you might pick from. And we're, sh we're showing you this to explain the methodology behind uh, how you need to pick and choose comparables based on like a, a, a rationale, a reasonable rationale. We describe that rationale at the bottom half of the page. So you've got sale one through sale five. Sale one is real tempting to use. It's, it's only variation is it's 290 square feet bigger. When you compare everything, uh, you can see it's mostly all the same, you know, except it's a little bigger. Sale two, the only variation is 180 square feet smaller and has no fireplace. So if a home has a porch and a home has a patio, uh, when you're comparing the two, it's a wash if the comparable has a porch and a deck. So I have a porch and patio at the subject and a porch and deck at the comparable. I don't usually make an adjustment for that. But when you look at comparable four and five, you see that there's many more things that are dissimilar between the two. And as soon as you're looking at comparable sales and all of a sudden, you can lift your hand and you say, okay, this is different, and that's different, this is different, and that's different, that's different. Okay, that, your, your hand's telling you to stop. Don't use comparables. If I've only got a couple fingers up of things that are different, then I say to myself, oh, you know what? It's pretty, it's pretty comparable. So you always want to pick comparables with the least amount of differences. The more differences you've got, the less comparable the property is. And properties that are incomparable don't yield good results. Next page. Page 165. Just give it a cursory review or 169. 
I wouldn't worry about that. Please know the definition of contributory value in the middle of page 170. Uh, contributory value is part of a larger concept known as contribution. So an item is only worth what it contributes to value. Hmm, what does that mean exactly? Well, if I put an in-ground pool in my property and I spend $70,000 because I'm in Spalding Lake and, you know, I've got to have, uh, I got to go through shale and, you know, it's like, it's a, it's a very laborious place to put a pool. I'm not going to get seventy, eighty, ninety thousand dollars $90,000 more because of that. But homeowners don't always do that, especially because here's what happens a lot. And I feel really bad when it happens, but I have this kind of luck. So I, I get it. The people put the nice pool in and then they get a job transfer. So they only enjoyed it for like six months. So they real, those are the kind of people that really want to make sure they get their money out of it. And it's sad because that makes your job so much harder because the concept of contribution shows you that you don't get what you spend on an item that you improve your property. You spend $8,000 on landscaping for the property. You're not going to get $8,000 more. You may get $1,500 more for the property. That's a typical number for really outstanding landscaping. She's asking about why they don't want number five. And the reason why it's too old. The sale is too old. And I think there's uh, it's too old. You want sales that are representative of the current marketplace. Bank appraisers have to use six months or less. One of the three comparables can be older than six months, but has to be under a year. You should follow the same rules that bank appraisers follow. Otherwise, when it comes time for that property to appraise out during the um, mortgage process, they're not going to be able to support the value. And then they're going to look to you for advice and you're going to be like, well, here's my comps from four years ago. And that's not going to work. Two years ago, it doesn't work. A year and a half is frowned upon. Okay. Page 171. Uh, 171 and 172. We give you, we talk about like values to make adjustments. It's not based, these values are not based on cost. These values are based on contributory value. You say to yourself, well, where do these come from? This came from that whole little batch of pages that I told you is paired sales analysis. So if you want to come up with the most current numbers for yourself to use, you can pull comparables and follow the example that we give you here for paired sales analysis. But anyways, you go, you know, you go back to the paired sales analysis. That's how you come up with values for a half bath. Values for a two-car garage compared to a one-car garage. Values for a porch and a deck compared to a home that doesn't have it. Page 173, we show you how to make adjustments like an appraiser. This is why I want to spend a little time with this. Because sometimes you get a question. It's, it's like a word problem. And the word problem they'll have on there, the subject and the comparable. One comparable they'll put. You don't have to pick a comp, but they provide the information. And they want to know if you know, and a good question will have more, will, co will co cover two concepts. So anyone that's writing a question wants to try to kill two birds with one stone. And, and this is where you'll see it on the state exam. Most often, well, first I got to explain something to you. Please write this down somewhere. You always adjust the comparables to make them like the subject. You always adjust the comparables to make them like the subject. We don't adjust the subject. We hold that steady. So when we look at sale one on Johnson Park, and we compare it to the subject, the one that we're putting a value on, on Willowdale. You can see that it's only to look at one item. So we, we, I really got to move ahead here. We have a two-car garage at the subject and a one-car garage at the sale, the comparable. Sale one is our comparable. We're using that to come up with a value for the subject. You would put your hands up like this and think of like, you know, the scales that you uh, they used to use in the olden days. I think they put gold on it or whatever. Um, if the subject property is here and it's got a two-car garage, it makes the scale heavier. 
the subject, the comparable sale has a one car garage. A one car garage is not so heavy. So what do we do to make it equal? We add another car garage. Sale two has no porch or deck. They have no exterior amenities on sale two on uh, Hillside Drive. The subject has a porch and a deck for exterior amenities. So we'll go back to the hands. Here's a subject again. We have a porch and a deck, go like this. What do we have to do to the sale, sale number two, comparable number two, to make it like the subject? We have to add the value of a porch and a deck. When we do that, the scales are equal. Please remember this analogy if you get any questions like this and when you do your own CMAs. And if you make adjustments, it'll make a world of difference. When I started in real estate at 18, I competed against people that were in the business for 20 years. And I can't begin to tell you how many how many listings I got from super experienced people because my market analysis was on spot. People looked at it and said, wow, we don't, the people we interviewed before you, they did not put any effort into it whatsoever like you did. Yours is almost like an appraisal. Well, that's why I became an appraiser after kudos like that for a number of years. That you always adjust the comparables to make them like the subject. Couple things about the cost approach on page 174. The cost approach um, is the second type of valuation we use for uh, real estate. You're hardly ever going to do it though, so I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but there's terms here that you want to make sure you know. But how you measure square footage is determined on page 177. You measure the outside perimeter of the property. Measure all, all the way around the perimeter. And then you subtract off unfinished spaces. So if there is an attached two-car garage, you exclude that. Now, people say, well, what about closets? Closets actually are included. I know it doesn't make sense, but they're included because it makes this house more functional. If it wasn't for having closets, you wouldn't have as functional of a house. That's the rationale behind why we include that as unfinished space. And then when you look here, we have a two-story portion with uh, the exterior dimensions are 35 by 25. So it's 35 by 25 times two. And the one-story portion is probably like a, a den or a family room, 12 by 15. So 12 times 15 times one gives you the square footage of the property, 1930 square feet. And I, I highly encourage you, again, here's something you can't unhear. Every time you list a home, you should measure it and determine if the square footage is accurate. Because it turns out that if the assessor is wrong, he or she will not be sued if you market the property based on that. You will be sued. Or you will get um, in trouble if they report you to the Board of Realtors. So don't, don't cut corners. Do your best to confirm and then going back to that sheet that we talked about last week about preparing a sheet to, you know, everything you want to know as a buyer, everything you want to know as a seller. One of the things I would always do when I sold real estate was I let them know what I did because we're in a very litigious society. So you want to let your um, sellers know that I measured the exterior square footage and it does approximately match with what the assessor has. But as soon as it doesn't, that should be, bells and whistles should be going off and telling you that there might be an illegal modification here. Did they convert something into living space or did they do an addition to the property without a building permit? Because nowadays, it's not like the Wild West back when I sold real estate. People are on their game when it comes to assessor records and, you know, and, and there's technology out there where assessors sit behind their desk and they get satellite images of what's going on behind the front porch of your property. So if you think you have that secret um, tennis court that you put in, but you didn't want to go get a building permit to have it set up, or you know, you've got uh, a big, huge patio that you put in, but you didn't get a building permit to, you know, because 
like things like that in some towns you do need a building permit for. Um, they can see it from the satellite and then come by and knock on your door and then fine you for it. Page 178. Uh, reproduction and replacement costs. Please know those definitions. Definitely want to know that they have shown up on the state exam. Then we talk about depreciation. There's three types of depreciation, physical, functional, and external. External is on page 179. Physical is what you're used to seeing from the rain, the snow, the, the peeling paint as a result of the elements. That's physical depreciation. Functional is um, based on standards that are considered outdated for today. Like if you go into a house and there's no closets or small closets, uh, that would be functional. If you go, um, go into the house and, and, and functional is based on what's typical for the neighborhood. Okay. So um, read through that. External are factors that are outside the property that can adversely affect your value. Okay. So external would be if you have a home that's next door to a, um, a bar or a tavern or next to a nuclear power plant, those things don't add value to your property. We call that external obsolescence or external depreciation. All the rest of this you don't have to worry about. You don't have to worry about anything on page 180. That's all extra information for you. You don't have to worry about anything on page 181 except what's in the middle of that page, and that's highest and best use. Know the definition of highest and best use. You always value properties, even as a real estate agent, you always value properties based on their highest and best use. And that's defined on 181. Page 183, we get into the income capitalization approach, and this gets back to... Um, Gino's question from earlier, I bet you thought I forgot about that. I didn't forget. Uh, cap rates. We define a cap rate on 184. And we talk about investor mentality at the bottom of 183. So when you value property that's income producing, like an office building, warehouse space, industrial land, we use a lot of principles from the income approach to valuation. The higher the risk, the higher the cap rate. The lower the risk, the lower the cap rate. You should know that for test purposes. The higher the risk, the higher the cap rate. So at the bank, you only get 1% interest if you're lucky to get 1% because it's very low risk. In the stock market, it averages, this is not my, not my numbers, these are numbers that have been taught for years in the eight to 13% range, because there's much more risk with the stock market, okay? Individual types of properties have more risk. So if I have a bar or a restaurant, the cap rate will be much higher than if I have a 12 unit apartment complex. Think about it, it's a lot easier to rent out a apartment building than it is to all the hassles you deal with when you own a bar got to staff it, you got to make sure people don't go in, drink, and then drive drunk, and then you get sued because you serve them. There's a whole bunch of things to worry about when you own a bar, any establishment that serves liquor. So a cap rate at the top of 184 is always a number that's less than one. For example, a typical cap rate for a restaurant would be between 25 and 35%. A typical cap rate for an apartment building would be between six and 8%. It may be less. Like a two family home could have a cap rate closer to four or 5%. Again, the higher the risk, the higher the cap rate. The lower the risk, the lower the cap rate. So the way to come up with the cap rate, Gino, is you take a big number and you divide it into a smaller number. This is really deep, right? and you come up with a decimal. So it turns out that if you do it any other way, you're not gonna get that decimal. So the numbers we're talking about is the value of the property. We have this thing called the IRV, I -R -V, the IRV formula. I is the income, IRV, 
V is the value or the sale price of the property. R is the cap rate. We know that a cap rate is always a number less than one. It's not gonna be 0.7 or 0.8, that's just ridiculous. It's gonna be something lower. So to find the cap rate, you have to find comparable properties, know what kind of net operating income they have, and divide that net operating income by the sale price of that property. Then you get a number of cap rates and you start establishing a pattern. And you can say, okay, all the apartment buildings on the west side of Buffalo have cap rates between 8 and 11%. That's actually a wider spread than you might think. Then what you do with that cap rate, again, you divide a big number into a smaller number. So 300,000 value divided into 22,000 net operating income is going to definitely give you a decimal, something point, something, something. So then what you do with that, long story short, I, ho I hope, let me know if you understand what I'm saying too as I'm explaining this to you. Once you've got a number of cap rates for a type of property or a neighborhood, again, we don't do this for residential. We do this for income producing properties. Then all you do is you take the net operating income of the subject property. Remember, subject is the one that we're putting a value on. You take the net operating income of the subject property, which we'll know because we're going to talk to the owner and say, how much do you net after you pay all your expenses? Oh, you, you net 30000 a year? Okay, great. Well, the cap rate from your neighborhood for similar properties is 0 0.30. So 0 0.30 divided into that net operating income of 30,000 gives you the big number. Because it turns out when you divide a little number into a big number, you get a bigger number. So it sounds like you're getting it. And we'll see more about this when we do more of the commercial part of the program, okay? But go through it carefully. It's helpful. Because you don't know, you might you might lose an opportunity to list something that's income producing that could get you huge commissions. And it would be sad because you actually have all the information you need to value any kind of property in this book. So read through everything on 185. The IRV formula is what you're most often tested on at the state level. So if you're just worried about the test, you know you're not going to be listing anything crazy, just regular typical residence, uh, residential properties, then don't knock yourself out of all the minutia here. Page 186, you should know how to determine, um, you should know how to determine net operating income. That's described at the bottom of the 186. You have PGI, potential gross income, that's PGI. We subtract vacancy and collection costs. Now, sometimes you get one question on this, sometimes. If your head's too full with information, don't knock yourself out with this. Just give it a cursory review. But PGI minus vacancy and collection costs gives you EGI, that's effective gross income. I'm at the bottom of 186. Then you subtract your annual expenses. In other words, the expenses to run that property get subtracted from the EGI. Then your net operating income is what results. Please know for test purposes, we never count mortgage payments. We never count mortgage payments as part of the NOI. Page 187, we give you some more examples of things. Just give a cursory review. And then what I like to do is uh, we, we did cover a lot of math. The math that's in the book is relatively straightforward. So go through that. I can talk about any questions you have, like multiplication, division. You know, if you have an issue, let me know. 